Alin Kaga, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. So you have a new book out called Silence in the Age of Noise, where you philosophize about silence. But what's interesting about you, you have an interesting background because besides being a philosopher, a writer, you're also an explorer and an adventurer. You were the first person to complete the Three Poles Challenge. For those who aren't familiar with that, what is the Three Poles Challenge? It is uh, the North Pole, South Pole, and uh, Mount Everest, which is called the Third Pole. So um, I guess the Third Pole was something the Brits came up with when it no Brits managed to reach the North Pole or South Pole. They invented the name Third Pole for Mount Everest. So, yes, I was the first to get to those three places on foot. On foot. And I'm curious, what what led you to exploring? Was this something you always wanted to do as a child? Or was there a moment in your young adult life where you thought, it's a good idea to go by foot to the North, South Pole and Mount Everest? <laughs> I think we are all born explorers in the sense that when I look at my own kids or all the kids, you know, they you know they want to have more space around themselves. They're wondering what's hidden behind the door, and you know, we'd like to see what's beyond the horizon. So I think you know we are all born in that way. But somehow, when we grow up, already when we're three, four, five years old, that spirit start to diminish because we have so many expectations from parents, friends not to mention schools. So, but it never goes to zero. So, I mean, but it's, it slowly diminish, diminishes through early life and through your teenagers. But somehow I kept that spirit, this enterprise of uh, a spirit of enterprise. And I kept on dreaming about seeing the world. And besides those feats, have you done anything else and explored any other mountaintops or any other things like that? Yes, through the 80s and the first half of the 90s, I sailed across the oceans, like the Atlantic Ocean a couple of times. I sailed from New York to Panama and down all the south, first down to Antarctica, next to South America. And I did long hikes. I went to many mountains. I uh, did all kinds of adventures. And I think, you know, it's life is very much about fulfilling fulfilling your own potentials and for me curiosity has always been a very important thing so yeah so i kept on doing it and i still still do some of it and, and what's interesting too during this time you were also working as an attorney as a lawyer so i mean how did you balance all your adventuring with the the work a day your work a day life and also during this time did you have children Yes, I think, you know, it's it's uh, obviously I traveled to many remote areas, but I also traveled to many cities and met people throughout the world. And my experience is that most people underestimate their own possibilities in life, put too many limits on themselves. Of course, some people overestimate themselves, but I think the most common thing is that people don't see their own possibilities in life. And as I said, for a while, I worked as a lawyer. I enjoyed it, but it was not for me kind of to sit in the back seat and try to tell people what to do, mainly after they did some mistakes. But I enjoyed it. And yes, I also got three teenage daughters. Obviously, they you know it's uh, the um, I'm not living with the mother, but she's living in the next street here in Norway. So I have the I have my daughters living with me half the time. And that's of course that's uh, that's kind of the fourth pole, even more demanding than the three first poles. <laughs> But, you know, yeah. that that's also gives life uh, a greater meaning. Yeah. So, yeah, don't, I think a lot of people when they hear, because we've had other adventurers and explorers on the show, and a lot of these guys, they're not, they don't do it full time. They also have day jobs. And what you said about not putting limitations on you, they, they all say that too, is that if you really want to make, if you really want to do something, you can make it happen for you if you really make it a priority in your life. Yeah, I think that's I think that's you know that's a very good attitude in the sense that you know some people say I think maybe the most important the most common thing I heard as a kid was that you know this is not possible you can't do this you're not going to succeed blah 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 and somehow it's just as you know correct to say to a kid that you know this is impossible or everything is impossible as to tell a kid that everything is possible but somehow 
I never listened to those people who said that uh, this, you know, you will never succeed. Of course, sometimes they were right, but quite often they were incorrect. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's that's an experience that we explorers kind of have in common. But I also think it's an experience that, you know, most people have in common. That if you first decide to go for something and you're also willing to suffer on the way, it's quite likely you will reach a goal. So after you completed the Three Poles Challenge, uh, you decided to attend Cambridge University to study philosophy. Was there something about those adventures that led you to start studying philosophy, or was that something you always wanted to do? I think life very much about curiosity. I, 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 I try to keep up my curiosity. It's very easy to forget it in a daily grind in life because of some of the things that kind of seems more important and to explore your own mind, try to understand and getting to know yourself and also try to fulfill your own potentials. But fortunately, after being on expeditions for years, and I also became the first to walk alone to the South Pole, which was kind of a unbelievable experience for me to walk in total solitude for 50 days and nights without any radio contact and the midnight sun. And especially after that expedition, I felt more for exploring my own mind. And then I was fortunate to become a so-called visiting scholar to Cambridge and read philosophy for a year. I think it's, you know, in one way, although it doesn't have the physical dimension, I think it's as, you know, still kind of the, you know, still some of the same challenges as I met as being an explorer, putting one foot in front of the other. What kind of philosophy were you focusing on? while you're at Cambridge? Uh, I was focusing on moral philosophy uh, because uh, my supervisor at the time, he, that was his seal. But for me, it was more about testing my limits, trying to understand, try to dig into something which was I found really complicated. And uh, I'm a strong believer in uh, making life more difficult than necessary. Obviously, if, if you're born in southern Sudan, you don't need to have that attitude because life is extremely difficult. But living in Norway, which, you know, in the Western world, I think it's, I think it's important to voluntarily make your life more difficult than it has to be. Why is that? Is it, is it because we atrophy if we don't? What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's because, uh, I think it's because the kind of the struggle to survive to have a fairly good life, material-wise, that you have, you know have a place to live, which is okay at least, and you also know that you're going to have sufficient of food every day. In Norway, you probably get a job. So in that sense, many of the things that used to be a struggle a hundred years ago uh, in my country is now kind of something obvious. It's something that most people experience. Um, but I think we're born in a way that we want to explore. We want to suffer a little bit. We need to suffer a little bit to reach our goals. We need to, if life becomes too easy, it uh, it's, uh, somehow feels meaningless. And life is very easily uh, you know, filled up with boredom. Not boredom in the sense that I had as a kid that there was nothing to do, that I was, and boredom was about being left out, not having anyone to play with, uh, nothing was hap- happening, it was about sadness. But when I look around today in 2018, boredom is very much about having too much to do. It's too many TV series, games, apps, Instagram, Snap, Facebook, uh, etc., etc., etc. But that's a, another form of boredom. And uh, those two boredoms are quite, you know, it's the uh, res- result is quite the same. That life feels uh, empty, and you get this feeling that life moves very fast, that life is very short. And I think life is short if you do the same things and kind of meaningless things every day. While I think if you turn around and start to do more difficult things, challenge yourself, have more variety in life then life doesn't feel short anymore. Life, feel, uh, life feels long. Uh, that's a nice segue to my next question, which, or to your book, discussing your book, Silence. You mentioned this, this boredom, other type of boredom, where there's too much 
going on in our lives, too much noise. And silence is the antidote. So before we discuss you know, the benefits of silence, how do you define silence? Is it simply the absence of sound or is it something bigger than that? Yeah, it's... Uh when I sat down to write this book, uh, which just have that many words, but I still spent a year and a half to write it. And uh, my life so far, the experiences to be able to do it. I was f- focusing on silence as, uh, as no sounds, being a quiet place. But after a while, I understood that the most silence is the inner silence, not silence that surrounds you, but silence in your mind. And... At the time, I had, as I said, three teenage daughters. And I understood that those girls, they did not know what silence is at all. Their life is filled up with noise. Not noise in the sense of sounds, but noise in the sense of distractions throughout the, the whole day. That they're always connected. They're always living through a device. They kind of always try to be someone who they are not. And they have all these expectations about being part of something and living through other people. And all this is about noise. And then I think, and then again, of course, noise is always easier to relate to than silence. So, um, but noise still is about forgetting yourself. It's about living through your device. It's about living through other people. And the opposite to me is uh, silence is about turning around 180 degrees and focusing on yourself. Not in the sense that you're going to live a more egocentric life. I think silence is very much about seeing yourself. It's about understanding the world. It's about respecting other people. It's about loving the earth even more. So you you studied philosophy. Uh, I'm curious: Have philosophers said anything in regards to silence? Like, what what do they think? Is it something that they they value? Is it how do they describe silence? How do they describe the benefits of it? I think that's a very good question. I, I also asked myself when I start to write the book because I had not read uh, any philosophers writing you know something really interesting about silence. And I kept on asking philosophers about it because I didn't find it myself. And then I understood that somehow philosophers uh, in general, at least the ones I came by, they have not been interested in silence. And I think that's based upon a deep or grave misunderstanding in the sense that the first year at the new philosophy, you learn that nothing comes from nothing. And of course, that's correct. It's also easy to think about silence as nothing. And I think that's what many philosophers have been doing. But in my book, as I try to show that silence is not nothing. Silence is something. So something comes from something. So I think that's, you know, maybe it's a, it's a mistake that philosophers had been doing for quite a few hundred years. But of course, in the old days, like Aristotle and Plato and others, they said that Beyond the words, we can't find any more words. It's getting quiet, where it's good silence. That's then where you will experience the truth. So you experienced silence, I am sure, in the way you're talking about when you walked by foot in the Antarctic, the South Pole, you were alone for 50 days. What was that like? I mean, what what did that experience of silence feel like? And also, I mean... What did what were what what did you perceive? I guess like I'm asking like what what was the phenomenological experience that, of of silence of being alone in the South Pole for fifty days? I think you know it's what was interesting. I think I experienced the same as most people who had done in the same place. That for the first hours or first couple of days, I found the silence disturbing, especially the first day. My uh, also maybe the second day. My head was filled with noise. It was absolutely silent around me. It was white all the way to the horizon. The skies were blue, not a sound, but I still had all this noise in my head. I was thinking too much. I was not totally present. But then I slowly started to adapt to circumstances. I uh, stopped thinking. I started more to experience uh, the world as it was there and then. 
And then I started to feel more and more comfortable. And as the days and weeks passed by, I started to see that it's not totally white in Antarctica after all. It has this small variation, so bluish, greenish, yellowish, pinkish colors in the, in, the, in the snow and the ice. And it's not totally flat either. I start to see more and more details, structures in the snow and on the ice. So in that sense, the nature or the experience of the environment became richer and richer. And I also became better and better at having a dialogue with the nature that I can sending some ideas out and getting all the thoughts back again. And of course, many of these experiences are, are experiences kind of hard to put words on. That's also one of my points in my book that quite often words put limits on your experiences. If you got to describe everything you go through in life in words, you put limits on yourself because I think it's many things in life which is which is beyond beyond words. So for me, the silence through those 50 days and nights became, you know, silence became somehow my best friend and silence has its own language. So I think, you know, it's, it's very healthy to be alone for a while and be silent for a while. Of course, some parts of life, it's not possible, but other parts of life, it, you don't have to walk to the South Pole. Somehow you have to find your own South Pole. When, when you say you, say you stopped thinking, do you mean like you just stopped having that internal dialogue in your head? Is, is that what yeah, you, you know, it's just started. I was still thinking about life back home, worries. I was thinking about this girl I was in love with. She was not in love with me. All, you know, this kind of daily struggles that we have. But then, you know, all this worries somehow disappeared. And I became press, more and more present in my life. That the past didn't matter. The future, I didn't care about the future. It was only life there and then uh, that mattered to me, and I think that's you know that's a, that's a, that's a great luxury. I'd, I'm not interested in living, you know, having that kind of life rest of my life because I think we're all born to be social, we're born to be together with other people. But uh, for me, it was a very healthy experience, and I quite often asked from people that are wondering how. I would think they will react to be in such circumstances. My answer is that I think you know most people would experience it more or less the same way as I did. Not exactly the same way, but you know, I think most people find it enriching to be in silence for such a long time. And I'm curious, like you, you, you came to this feeling of being present, the the past, the worries of the past, the worries of the future, no longer. Because I'm I'm sure we've all experienced that in, in fleeting moments, and I'm sure you got a little bit longer while you're there. How long did that last when you came back to civilization? You know, you got back to daily life really quickly. You get home, it takes a long time before you know, quite a few weeks before you actually get home. But when you get home. <laughs> It's daily life again. I mean, your washing machine doesn't work. You get to have it repaired. You need to pay your bills. You need to start to work. So then it goes really back to normal quickly. But, you know, we are part of all that we have met in life. So in that sense, the experience remained with me. Um, I still have it after all these years. And when I sat down to write a book on silence, it was... My experiences from the ice, from the oceans, from the mountains, from urban life, from being a family father, for being an entrepreneur, being a lawyer for a short time. All these experiences kind of made it possible for me, for me to write about silence. If I only had been a polar explorer, I think I could still write a book about silence, but I think it would be pretty boring. Yeah. I, I thought it was interesting, too, how one of the... Um observations you made about your experience in the Antarctic alone was similar to, we wrote an article about Richard E. Byrd, who was at the South Pole for five months by himself back in the 1930s. And one of the things he commented on was that he stopped swearing. Like he didn't use curse words. 
and you and you had that same thing like you didn't have you didn't feel the urge or need to curse when you were by yourself <laughs> i didn't know that that's interesting um i haven't read so much about bird but it's um yeah that's that's correct it's uh when i'm on an expedition i never swear i hardly i hardly utter a negative word and uh, it's not because it's blasphemy that could be you know good enough reason but it's because it's so negative when you swear, it drags you down. And especially when you're alone, then you feel it much stronger than when I'm with other people because then you can swear and life goes on and the dialogue goes, you know, keeps going. But being alone or being with one or two other people in this very kind of life, on, you know, it's that you're very much present in the situation through the whole day. If you're not, you know, it's, it's, it could be very dangerous. And then when you're so present in your life and live there and then, and you swear, that feels like a totally stupid thing to do if it's dangerous or if you're pissed off because you did something silly or things that, that didn't work out the way you wanted. And uh, then if you swear, the situation is only getting worse. And if you swear more, you know, it keeps on swearing, it just gets uh, worse and worse. Uh, yeah, I remember on my expedition to the North Pole with my friend Berger Osland. We decided not to swear, but uh, on day three expeditions, uh, I never decided. I'd just don't do it. Yeah, just don't do it. Just something. It's, it's inter- I, just, I just thought that was interesting that you both had the same experience in, in the South Pole. Yeah, and today, and today uh, in daily life, I hardly swear anymore because uh, because when I was a kid, a teenager, I was swearing. I thought that was cool, but uh, today, I hardly swear at all. So you you mentioned earlier. You mentioned that when you first started your your trek to the South Pole, the silence was frightening, but then it became comforting. Why is that? I mean, I think for a lot of people, silence is extremely frightening. The silence that happens when you're in conversation with someone, for example, and there's that awkward silence and you feel uncomfortable. What is it about silence that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, uh, I agree. And uh, as I also mentioned that when I was a kid, silence for me, was awful. It was uh, when I was lonely, when I was sad, when nothing was happening. That was silence for me. And of course, later in life, silence is very much about sadness. It could be about one minute of silence. But many people have been writing about this kind of silence. And when I want to write about silence, I want to write about this different silence, this different this silence which is enriching, which is good for you. And um, I think the reason. People try to avoid uh, this silence I'm writing about this because this inner silence is because in this silence you meet yourself. And a man has always tried to avoid silence. Like uh, Blaise Pascal wrote about it 350 years ago, that man has always tried to avoid silence. And if he sits in a room in silence doing nothing, he will always try to start to do something. And that's the beginning of all his problems. So this is not something new. And it's, as I said, it's easier to live to noise than turning around and start to look into, into yourself. And I think that's why, that's why it's quite tempting to, to go for the easiest option to, to avoid yourself. Yeah, I think th- I've read experiments there where they've had people sit alone by themselves and all they had was this button where they could push it and it would shock them. And people ended up like they'd rather be they'd rather shock themselves than be bored. Right. So it's like they, they couldn't they couldn't go very long without some sort of stimulation, even though that stimulation was uncomfortable and unpleasant. Yeah, and you know it's it's it sounds always insane that People, instead of sitting in total silence, not having anything to do for 15 minutes, rather have an electric shock than remain sitting. And I think it's actually, it doesn't only sound insane, I think it is insane. And I think in one way, the world, whole world has turned insane the last 20 years with internet, not to mention the last 11 years with smartphones. That's if, if my grandmother, who died more than 20 years ago, if she had seen how we're living today, if she had seen 
grown men walking down the streets, having a phone uh, close to the air, kind of like looks like you know all kind of carrying around on teddy bears, kind of taking them to over you know to overhead and in the cause of it. I think she would think they're t- turned absolutely nuts. And uh, but of course, if everybody is insane, insanity is the new normal. So I think you know I think it has gone t- go too far. I'm not negative to technology, not at all. But it's a way we relate to technology, which is I think it's not only strange, but I think it's it's bad for us. It makes us even more lonely. It makes us even more depressed. It makes us even more desperate. While I'm not negative technology as such, but I'm also very concerned that some of the brightest minds in the world work day and night to make us addicted to different apps and different technology. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've seen that too. Like The difference between, say, my generation or our generation and my grandfather. My grandfather passed away a few years ago. He was 101. And my cousin and I were having the discussion about how it never seemed like my grandfather was like anxious or like there was some sort of like pent up anxiety in him. It was just really like centered, calm, et cetera. And I mean, the one difference, I'm sure there's a lot of difference, but the one difference was he never owned a smartphone. Like, he never, <laughs> yeah. he never had all, he never had all that noise constantly bombarding him. Exactly. And they probably also had, you know, it's a different time in America. So probably also had, you know, other obligations that, you know, his life probably was, you know, tougher in many ways than your life. And that also, you know, gave his life much more meaning right away because, you know, it was the daily struggle was different from uh, your daily struggles. So besides uh, being a lawyer, a philosopher, an explorer, you also are an art collector. So you are, you know, you're like the most interesting man in the world here. I'm, I'm curious, what can art teach us about silence because it's it, art is off, like we're talking about like paintings are something you you consume silently often <laughs> you know it's uh, first i first have to say that you know it's a privilege being to it by you but you know for me what we talk about now you know i, t- I just find it you know, a t- true privilege that people are interested in, in all in, in in this thoughts i have about uh, silence and it's to me it's a great you know positive surprise but in terms of art yeah, I think art is also very much about silence. Let's say great art is about silence. I think quite often love see art is about noise, but it's great art. And I think about, you know, when you see it, if you want to understand any of it, you need to have some silence. Of course, some people can explain things to you, but if you're going to appreciate great art, you need silence, inner silence. And the reason I'm saying this is because an art piece, it's a painting, sculpture, installation, or video, somehow has to contain the artist's defeats, the artist's humor, the artist's love affairs, the artist's lovesickness, the artist's loneliness, the artist's victories, the art, artist's doubts, etc., etc., etc. And somehow a lot of this has to go into the art piece. And then, of course, it's very difficult to grasp what the art is about and maybe it's not supposed to understand you know everything about an art piece but somehow this art piece art piece is a thinking box a kind of just this kind of item that has you know all these thoughts in it to understand any of it i think you need to be silent yeah it was i mean one of my mo- one of my favorite things to do is go to an art museum and just look at look at art and what's interesting about art is that sometimes what you see depicted, you can tell that there would be a lot of noise there, right? Like one of my favorite paintings or something you see quite a bit, it's, it's a lot of artists have done it, is, is, is Cato the Younger committing suicide, mm-hmm. right? He decided, you know, he didn't want to be under the rule of an emperor, commit suicide. And you see the, the, how the artists depict all these, you can tell there's a lot of commotion and noise going on, but like you don't hear anything. And you don't, I don't, it's, it's a weird thing. Like you can, you can, you don't hear anything at the same time you, you can, you can hear what's going on in the painting. Exactly. I, I love that combination because somehow, as I say, you know, this frozen moment 
you know, taking out, you know, and, and made into a painting, which is of course sunless. And and I, you know, I just I just like that that uh, that combination that you can stand in peace in, in the silence and see a great piece of art and. And you, in your case, that you know the story about uh, Cato and why he committed suicide, and see how the artist had interpreted that story, and of course also put so much of herself himself into uh, that piece of art. That's great. So it's, uh, I think that's you know something that makes life even more meaningful. In my book on silence, I included several paintings by your fellow American uh, Ed Ruscha. And one of those paintings is a blue back background, and then it says in huge yellow letters, noise. And the reason I had it because the painting is quiet, it's silent. And then you just have this strong word all over the painting and nothing else. So kind of the words contradict the painting, uh, kind of one-to-one. -one. So that, that's something I found really interesting. So you said earlier that people don't need to walk all the way to the South Pole to experience the, the silence that you're talking about, the benefits of it, and then they can find their own South Poles. Like, so how how can regular people who just live in their workaday lives experience silence on a regular basis? And, and does it have to be for extended periods of time? Can it? Can you just catch it in just a few minutes and still get the same benefit? No, I, um, I think that's a very good question. It says that that's uh, that's a question I'm asked quite often. And then again, as I said earlier on, I think most people underestimate underestimate their own possibilities in life because even. When you're having kids, or if you're having a very busy job, or if you have a complicated relationship, blah, 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 you know, you can still experience silence. And I find silence in the morning when I wake up in my bed. Of course, if you have kids, babies screaming, it's not so easy, but still. And then I find silence when I prepare uh, breakfast for my kids. Then I find silence when I, I quite often walk to my office, which takes half an hour, but you can't always walk to your office, of course, but then you can still find silence walking the stairs up to my office. And then on the way back again from the office, I can find silence doing the stairs or to, instead of taking the metro all the way home, I can jump off from the station earlier and walk. And walking is very good for silence. And then cooking again can find silence. And I find silence when I'm listening to music. I think that's quite often if it's too much noise in my life, I have to just turn on the uh, music with a high volume. Then I find an inner silence. I find silence when I'm having a shower. I find silence when I'm reading. Uh, you can find inner silence when you're having sex. You find inner silence when you go to bed to sleep again. Sometimes it is for two minutes. Other times it's for longer, like in the weekends, I do hikes in the forest. So... You know, to find this inner silence, you know, you really have to want it. And of course, you can find it by also by having yoga, uh, mindfulness, uh, meditation. All that is very good, I think. But somehow we have to prepare for it. it, it you know, it requires a technique. Um, but when I sat down to write about silence, I want to write about this silence, which is there all the time. It's inside you waiting for you, but you have to go look for it. Yeah. And one thing I noticed in all those examples you gave, you could interrupt it, interrupt the silence by bringing your smartphone along. Because there, there are people who will take part in all those activities, be in the forest. I've even read having sex. And they'll still use their smartphone, which to <laughs> yeah. me is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just, I met a guy on the street the other day and he said to me, uh, understood. When I'm doing a walk, I should have nothing in my hands. That's the whole thing. Of course, I, if you walk with your phone in the whole uh, uh, in your hand, you know, then you're not going to have any silence. But if you turn off your phone, preferably, you know, leave it back home or turn it off and put it in the in the backpack or in the pocket, then it's so much easier to relax. Because I think as long as the phone is on as, and it's available, you're so attracted to that phone, and it's so much complicated not to look at the phone. 
that you will do it. I read this article that people on average touch their phones 2,600 times a day. That sounds a lot, but I have to say, when I look at my daughters and sometimes I look around at the metro, to me, it seems like people touching their phones even more. Yeah, no, it's true. And it's like, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's a total waste. No, yeah. Touch, touch from the throughout to the whole day. And it's not about not being connected to the world, but you know, you Google something, you find what you're looking for, and 20 minutes later, you're still Googling. You're checking the news, you see the news, and you keep on checking the news. And you know, the news are quite alike throughout the whole day, actually. I think the news are more or less the same every day. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's about wasting this huge, fantastic opportunity you have to live a rich life. Yeah, it's, it's that fear of the silence. So, like, if you, once you feel that fear, just you got you to gotta embrace yeah, it. It's a fear of the silence, a very f- common fear of the silence. And it's, uh, you can always say that it really doesn't matter. But, uh, but uh, I think it's a bit sad, actually, that people are living through, you know, that kind of, you know, running away from themselves. And, and, and I'll say that, you know, sometimes I do it, do it too, that, you know, it's, I, I kind of get, you know, so much into my phone or into a device that I check it all the time that I'm, you know, watching all this series, uh, that I'm checking the news again and again and again. And, and, you know, just after half an hour, one hour, a few hours, I start to feel this, you know, having this really uncomfortable feeling, but I still do it because it's, it's, you know, you get, you get, you get addicted. And of course, every app is made for the user to get addicted. And, you know, so then they have to give, you know, great promises. And then you're going to be satisfied for a short period. We can't be satisfied for long because that's, of course, the basic of capitalism that you should be satisfied for a while. And then you need to desire something totally new. So I'm not skeptical, skeptical to capitalism and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you just have to be aware that that's the whole trick. And uh, we have to look through it. And we have to, you know, choose a slightly more narrow path. Is there some place people can go to learn more about your work and your book? You know, Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I don't think people should <laughs> listen too much to me because that's also why I want to write a li- really short book on silence. I, I ask three questions. What is silence? Where is it? And why is more important today than ever? And I try to give 33 really short answers so you can read it in one evening. And then after that, I think, you know, you need to find your own path, Swamarga, as a, you know, as I said in San- Sanskrit. That it's not complicated at all. As I said, the silence is there, but I think it's, you know, to read, spend one evening to read about it and then think through it. I think you will find your own silence. And I think you need to keep in mind that you need to create your own silence and you need to, 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 to keep that spirit. But that's totally up to you. Totally. Well, Arlene, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. My guest here is Arlene Kaga. He is the author of the book, Silence in the Age of Noise, available on amazon.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash silence. And if you're looking to embrace friction and discomfort like Arlene was talking about in the podcast, we developed a platform called The Strenuous Life that's designed just for that. You sign up, it's a membership platform. You get weekly challenges. There's different badges for different skills you can earn. It's all geared on making your life a little bit more uncomfortable, a little more discomfort and getting you out of your comfort zone. So go check it out, strenuouslife.com. CEO. Got an enrollment coming up. Get your name on the waiting list so you can be one of the first to know when it goes live. So you can check it out, strenuouslife.co.